Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Matt the Family Guy, Kent the Cat Guy, Jacqueline from JP Mint, and Greg the Single Guy, bringing you episodes from around the world about the best kept secret in education. You've got it, international teaching. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the uh, another episode of the ITP. This is Greg the Single Guy, and I do have quite a crew here with me. I've got Kent the Cat Guy. How you doing, Kent? Great to be here, Single Guy. Awesome. And I've got Jacqueline tuning in from Mexico. How you doing, Jacqueline? I'm fantastic. I'm super excited about our guest today, Greg. Oh, I know. It's Debbie, and she's coming in from Abuja, Nigeria. And Debbie, I think you're the first one from Africa calling in on an interview. I might be Ooh. wrong about that. But please, everybody, welcome Debbie. Debbie, how are you doing tonight? Woo! I'm great. Woo! Welcome, <laughs> Debbie. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be here with you guys. What we like to do, Debbie, right away is to get a little bit of a elevator version of how your journey went into international leading up to Abuja and a little bit how you want to present it. So, All right. So I'm Brazilian, uh, but I have Japanese background uh, and I was born in Peru. So it's a little bit confusing, but uh, my, my dad is Japanese Peruvian. My mom is Japanese Brazilian. They met in Japan uh, and I was born in Peru where my parents uh, started their life together. And then we moved to Brazil where I grew up and studied. Um, so from there, I grew up in Brazil. I knew some Spanish because that was my first language. And when I went to college, I thought, why not using what I already have and what I already know into something that is new And uh, Spanish was getting really popular in Brazil. Uh, but not many people were capable, like the universities were starting to open up to, to being able to, to help people learn Spanish, to become teachers and teach Spanish in schools. So I'm like, okay, so I may do that. And that's what I did. So I started, I did, uh, my, uh, bachelor's degree in like, um, languages, English, Portuguese, Spanish, and then after that, I started my teaching career in Brazil. And then after that, I got an opportunity in the U.S. with uh, the VAF program, the former VAF program, Visiting International Faculty, which uh, they brought people from all over, from like many countries in the world to teach in the U.S. with the idea of like the American citizens hardly ever go out. So why not bring internationals into the country and have them teach and exchange culture with them. So that's what I did. That's why my international career started in the U.S., in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I stayed for three years. And then my contract was over and I thought, what am I going to do next? Uh, is there anything out there for me? I don't want to go back to Brazil. So I actually ended up applying for uh, with ISS to teach internationally, uh, and I got an interview with uh, with a school in Turkey, which is Coach, where where I met Jacqueline. <laughs> yeah, so that was interesting for me. Like it was like four days of interviews and talking to people, talking to different schools, and then all of a sudden I had a a contract, and I'm like, Turkey it is, I guess. So I went to Turkey. So did you, sorry, uh, Debbie, I don't want to interrupt, but did you go to a job fair or was it strictly through ISS, like back and forth emails? I did go to a job fair. It was in San Francisco, the ISS job fair in San Francisco. So I interviewed with a few schools. I got two different offers, one from Kuwait, one from Coach. And then I ended up accepting the job in, in, in Turkey at Coach. So can so, I tell a funny story about Debbie and and getting her resume? So I was uh, moving into the head of departmentship and they said, hey, uh, great news. We just hired uh, our first new Spanish teacher. And I was like, awesome. Can I see her CV? And I look at her CV and I go, oh, crap, she's Brazilian. You guys know that that's not Spanish, right? It's Portuguese. <laughs> and I was so worried that they had just hired a Portuguese teaching Spanish teacher. I was so panicked. And then they said, no, no, we really interviewed her. She's really a Spanish teacher. And then I, 
you know, shortly after talked to her and was reassured Spanish was her mother tongue. And I was just excited to have her because of that extra bump of internationalness, you know, like we're always looking to diversify departments and diversify schools. And if you're always hiring a, a Spanish teacher from Spain, it can get a little heavy, right? The whole department's all Spanish. But if you have a Brazilian with a Peru background coming in from North Carolina. I mean, it was just, it was the perfect storm. So I was really <laughs> excited to meet Debbie. Yeah, it was funny because at the end of the interview, they were like, okay, so yeah, we, that's that's great. You're accepting. Can you just say something in Spanish to us? <laughs> it was funny. Uh, I would like to add, Debbie, that the rest of the stories that Jacqueline tells about you, we're reserving for our Patreon-only episode. <laughs> So I would like to tell the ITP fans to look forward to that. <laughs> Debbie, I'm fascinated by your family. So Spanish was part of your household. Was Portuguese or Japanese also part of your household? That is an interesting question because then uh, I spent only three years in Peru, my first three years of life in Peru, and then we moved to Brazil. So I grew up in Brazil, right? But uh, So Portuguese is my mom's language. So yeah, so that's what we speak within the family. Okay. But uh, Japanese, because my dad is second generation of Japanese in Peru, and there is a huge colony of Japanese in Peru and in Brazil. Um, my dad's part of the family, they speak more like uh, a few words of Japanese here and there. So my dad is second generation, but his Japanese is not great. Although his parents <laughs> are Japanese. Uh, so it's kind of funny, but my cousins, they all speak Japanese. I don't, <laughs> I speak English, but my cousins, they all like in Peru, they all speak Japanese. My family in Brazil, we are fourth generation Japanese outside of Japan. So we are very Brazilians. So we yes. look Japanese, our last name is Japanese, but we're Brazilians. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to add real fast, and I think fans of the ITP might know this, is that I'm second generation Japanese out of the United oh. States, but my father, who's both his parents came from Japan and settled in California where he was born, speaks no Japanese. There was no common language mm -hmm. between his mother and him. <laughs> Oh, wow. That is interesting. Yeah, very interesting. They seem to, to work Kent it out. Is now, Kent is now studying Japanese, Debbie, because of his <laughs> inher uh, his heritage. That's right. I, oh. I, I speak about like a maybe a Japanese preschooler. I might be able to pass. <laughs> and then so they put me on that little program where the kids like walk to the store, you know, like the little three-year-olds. That could be me. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than Debbie. me, though, so like... Way to go. <laughs> it explains a lot about Kent. If you really look at him and see how he acts, he's very much a three-year-old. <laughs> so, Debbie, you you went to the job fair. You got um, informed or you know hired by a coach school in Turkey, and that was you said February. So, from February to July um, or June. Uh, how did you prepare for your first move, I guess, overseas? I mean, you know, from Brazil to U.S., if we don't count that within the Americas, your first overseas international teaching gig. I was actually overwhelmed. So I, I feel like that's how I say about the, inter the international life, right? I say like first year is when you're overwhelmed because everything's new. So it's, it's all crazy. So it's survival year. The second year where you're there, you see new people coming in and you're still like, I've learned so much. I can answer questions, you know? So it's, it's just so much fun the second year because you know what to expect. You know, when people are talking about things, you already know more or less what they're talking about. So it's pretty exciting the second year. The third year, I feel it's a complicated year for thinking about leaving because it's half of half of the year you're planning about, oh my gosh, what's going next? What's happening next? What's next? Am I going to get a job? Where am I going to get a job? Or how is it going to be? And then once you get it, the other half of the year is like, you're half mourning the process, like, oh, I'm leaving. Oh my gosh. Or, and that, but you're half excited about moving and going somewhere. So it's kind of like, 
difficult to navigate those kind of feelings. And people around you are also trying to navigate those feelings because you're leaving, but you're here. But maybe you're going to be gone in a few a few in a few months or like, oh, you're already gone because you you're leaving us anyways. You know, so it's it's so interesting how that works. And but my that year, I remember I was a lot of my friends that came with me with the program, they were staying. They were planning to apply for a new type of visa and they were planning to look for a job on their own and uh, away from the program. And there were rumors that the program would be able to extend our visas and, you know, it, it was going to be five years instead of three. But I ended up going to the job fair. And then for me, it was really fun talking to people, interviewing, thinking about possibilities. So it was so much fun for me. Um, but then preparing for it, it's kind of like this bittersweet kind of process. You you don't know exactly. I had gone to Turkey, I think a year before. So I had, and I was right in on the Asian side in Kadikyo, you know it, Jacqueline. So Kadikyo, so it's like lots of people, lots of life. And then... I didn't know that coach school was far away from civilization. <laughs> it's like it takes 45 minutes on a bus <laughs> to get there on a highway, kind of like, I didn't know that. So what I thought about Turkey was what I had seen before. So I'm like, okay, like preparing, thinking about it, or I don't excited because in like kind of relieved because I had something coming up, but not really sure what to expect. I, I don't think I thought through, uh, I missed the U.S. a lot on my first year in Turkey. So it was tough because life was crazy. Especially because she had this really crazy redhead as a supervisor. <laughs> no, that was the good side of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Debbie, I think that you summed up very well just the constant motion that there is to international teaching. And I think people coming, it almost feels like an airport sometimes. People coming, people going. You know, it took Greg two years just to find the bathroom. So it is, it is constant motion. And, and I think that, you know, with people who crave stability in their friendships and everything around them, it's quite a learning curve to go internationally and teaching because people come and people go and that sort of just that flexibility. I, I think you described it beautifully. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I feel like that's a constant for us, right? Always trying to adjust and adapt and uh, trying to create your own identity whenever you move. It's not an easy process. For me, it takes time for me to build my communities or to feel like this is actually home or, and, you know, so I think um, there's a lot in there for sure. I think one of the things, Debbie, I've learned over the years, and maybe you guys have too, all of all three of you, is that I've learned how to say, see you later down the road instead of goodbye. Right. It makes that that farewell a little bit easier for me. And I have, you know, some people cry because I'm leaving and other people, you know, hold parties when I'm leaving. And some people you know, cry when they see you coming. It's like, cry oh, with they, everything. Ex exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Kent. There's that three year old again. Anyway, <laughs> now, I just I think it's great that you've you've mentioned those feelings because we don't I mean, you're one of the first that's really talked about the feelings that you have. It's overwhelming. In my opinion, the first what I've tried to do is that when I finally go and recruit and I decide that I'm going to leave because you have that feeling. Jacqueline, did you have that feeling, you know, that you had to leave, right? Kent, you probably had that feeling that, you know, you or, or Carla knew that you had to leave that year. So you go and recruit. So that first half of the year, you're looking for jobs. You're in the job recruiting stage. You're still teaching and giving it a hundred percent. And then what I found though, is that that second half is amazing. Cause I will hold back from doing any research. I will hold back and I will just focus on teaching. And as soon as that last day of school, then I'm like online and I'm researching everything I can about maybe the country I'm going to go to. Right. Cause it's getting closer, but that's what I do. And I've been, I've done that seven different times. So it's, it's just my style and I don't have a spouse that comes with me. Uh, and Therefore, I don't have to worry about someone else is how else somebody else is feeling. So it's a little bit easier for me. But mm. I think that those feelings are very important. And I'm um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I feel like it helps me. I don't like to start thinking about the new school until 
the end of the like like you said, Greg, uh, until the end of the school year because otherwise I'm too divided and it's difficult. It's difficult to 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 navigate that. It's a lot because for me it's hard to leave. Once you leave, it's kind of like oh okay, I left. But the, the, the thinking of leaving is like, it's hard. I remember my, I was, I worked in two different schools in Turkey. So first was coach. I was there for five years. I taught middle school, Spanish middle school. Uh, and then I moved to another school, Escudat American Academy. And I taught there for three years. Uh, but I remember my last year, um, I had interviewed to go to, and I, I got a job and accepted a position in Myanmar. So when I was there, after I accepted that, my colleagues were like, one of my colleagues, she was like, oh, but you're not going to be here next year. So it was so dumb. I'm like, madam, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> so, but she was also trying to process the fact that I was not going to be there next year. So it's a lot of people like feeling sad that you're leaving too, you know, or and it's you being sad that you're leaving too, but also like you want to see things going. But at the same time, you don't worry about things the same way because you're like, I'm going, you know, like I'm not, I don't have to deal with that next year. So it's okay. I can deal with that now, but I don't have to deal with that next year, you know? So it's like, but dealing with everybody's feelings as well, it can be very difficult. Very so difficult. we have to talk about Myanmar next, right? Because I only okay. spent four hours in Myanmar. I was on a visa run from, from, uh, uh, Thailand. Right. So we had to go there and we had to get okay. a stamp and they made us gamble and drink and wait for the stamper. It took us four hours in the lobby. Beautiful they hotel. Made you gamble yeah. and, and drink. And it was a beautiful right. hotel with these. <laughs> I, re- I remember palm tree brand, like palm tree leaves as tall as me. I mean, what a beautiful country. Right. So I want to hear about Myanmar now. Let's leave all the feelings behind. Let's move on to the excitement of Myanmar. Can we do that? But wait, but wait, we didn't hear how she got Myanmar. No, like, let's just take one fraction step back, because I know a lot of our listeners want to hear how are people finding these jobs online? So let's talk about you were in Üsküdar, you decided, okay, eight years, this is going to be it. I'm leaving Turkey. So then how did you find Myanmar? Just Take us a step she back. She can't, after we have a new co-host, she takes over and organizes us too much. Can you believe it? Someone's got to organize us. Thank, Thank goodness. Thank God she's here. <laughs> All right. Yes. Debbie, please go ahead. Yeah. Myanmar was interesting because I I loved Turkey and it's hard not to, right? And after you, you spend there quite a few, yeah, yes, Jacqueline knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's amazing how chaotic it can be in the beginning, how crazy the school system can be in the beginning, but how, how then you, you learn and how well then you, you manage things and how well you make things happen for you at school. And then life is nice. I, I was very active at my church in, in Turkey too. So it was, it was a very international community. So we were, it was a really good group. We were, it was, it was just amazing. But at the same time, like I was there in Turkey during the time where there were some terrorist attacks going on, uh, visas were starting not to be renewed for everybody. There were some, it was a a coup d'etat and a failed coup d'etat happened, uh, in one of the years that I was there. So things were getting a little bit strange. So a lot of people were fleeing Turkey, like the intellectuals in Turkey, people like professors from universities, they were trying to get away from, from Turkey. People were being arrested. Uh, so it was a very political, politically tense. And in Turkey, I think Jacqueline can, I, I don't know, but at least in um In a few areas of life in Turkey, although things are very nice and very, you know, normal, uh, but you feel the presence of the government there, like whether it is in the education system, whether it is in the church system, like, so you kind of have this kind of sense that there's something out there, you know, like it, it is an interesting how that is. And it's hard to describe necessarily how, how that feels. Um, if you're not there, if you don't live there, or if you're not involved in those kind of things, but the government is very present. So when things started getting weird, 
my family started asking me, oh, don't you think it might be time for you to start looking for different opportunities? And I started thinking, I'm like, is it? Could it be like ISIS was there at some point? Like there were some, there there were some the the their extension within the country with the Kurdish people. So like a few things were happening, um, and I thought I've been here for eight years. It's gonna be this is my eighth year in Turkey. If I don't leave now, there's nothing that I dislike about Turkey. But like, if I don't leave now. I'm going to be here for, if I, if I stay here for 10 years, it's going to be hard because you get used to the system, you get used to your life, you get used to things and, and then you get a bit too comfortable, right? And it's hard for you to put yourself out in the market again or seeing like, oh, this is happening outside or, oh, this is how it's done. Oh, you know, so I'm like, you know what? I may try to do that. Uh, or maybe I should just try and see what's out there. So I talked to my, my, my director at that time. And I said, listen, I love Turkey. I love the school. I love the kids. I have been so happy here. My kids were amazing. And uh, the experience there at Uskudar American Academy was so rewarding professionally. So I was so impressed with the, the level of the students, with whatever I was getting. I'm like, I never thought it was possible. You know, my kids are speaking to me in Spanish. We're preparing them for this daily exam and they're succeeding. And, you know, it's so nice to see it. And they respond and they we challenge them and they respond it nice. So it was so good to me as a teacher. I was so proud of my students. Um, and I so I told him that, like, I was really honest. I'm like, I love it. I love the school. I love the kids. I love everything. But I'm feeling like there is a lot of tension like in 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 the air political wise society wise so i don't know i just want to go and see what's out there in the in the job fair uh there's a job fair happening now in uh in bangkok so i would i was planning on going there and seeing and the the the, the director was so nice to me and he said you know what i'm going to be recruiting at the end of january You want to go to the job fair? You go to the job fair. If you find something for you that you like, good for you. If you don't, we are happy to keep you. It was just so amazing to hear something like that. That is the best case scenario, Debbie, where you can go to a job fair and have that guarantee you do not need to leave if you don't find something. But you know, Jacqueline, what, what was funny about that? Because there was no pressure, right? I couldn't sleep in that job fair. I just couldn't sleep. I was so anxious because I think there was no pressure. There was no reason that I I should leave. So why was I there after all, you know? So it was so, I took melatonin from people, from some people. Like I said, I can't sleep. I cannot sleep. So it was so weird because I'm like, why am I like that? Because I have a job. I already have a job. But so there is no pressure for me to interview with people, for me to get a job here. And yet... I'm anxious. I'm more anxious than if I had to get a job, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting to me too, because I'm like, okay. And then I ended up interviewing with a few schools. A few schools took a bit long to get back to me. And this one school that I interviewed with first was Myanmar. And he just presented the school. He showed it to me. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, this was the bottom. It was on the bottom of my list (laughs) of the schools that I wanted. Like, I'm like, oh, and it was my first interview. I'm like, this guy, he might offer me a job. (laughs) So I'm like, and and then he did. And then he did. And we had a few more interviews. And he was like, so how is Myanmar compared to the other schools? Like, I have two schools that I am really interested in, but I, I need to hear from them. Could we schedule another interview? You know, so he was really, the, the director was also very patient with me. Uh, and I signed my contract at the very end of the job fair. It was on a Sunday, lunchtime, and we were signing a contract. And that's how it happened. What I like about that story, the most I like about that story, besides we're getting to Myanmar, is the fact that, 
that you picked a school that was not even on your radar. And so many guests, so many people that you talk to, and I know it, we all talk to at job fairs, the one thing everybody says is don't write off a place that you don't know or take a chance to at least interview with them because they might be gold. I did the same thing with Cambodia. I had no idea it was going to go there, et cetera. You know, long stories. Everyone has that little story. And yours with Myanmar wasn't even on the radar, right? I love that story. So you, you, you're you at the job fair. You signed the very last day. You went back and you had all the feelings about leaving and, and all that stuff. And can I, can I go on to Myanmar now, Jacqueline? <laughs> okay, well, I just got to check with the boss now. All right, Debbie, tell us about Myanmar. Myanmar was amazing. Myanmar was amazing. Uh, but it was a lot, too, because I was there for COVID. And I was there. I, I was there in total for five years. So I was there for COVID. And I was there for a coup d'etat that happened the year after COVID. They're, uh, they're following you around. The, the coups. I know. You know <laughs> Is it me? Is it it might be. It might be Debbie. I'm sorry. In Turkey, it was in a, a failed, an attempt, <laughs> a failed coup d'etat. But in Myanmar, it was a real thing. Ladies and gentlemen, so, our I, guest now is Debbie Koo. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, <laughs> Debbie. You've lived through a lot if you've been through two coups already. Yeah. I'm going to foreshadow and say that there were also issues in Nigeria. Stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> okay, but yep. Myanmar, you got there and... Did they roll out the red carpet? Did they greet you at the airport? Did they have an apartment ready for you? What was the landing like? It was the preparation before landing was amazing. We had this uh, one teacher, uh, Graham Anning, uh, Canadian, and he <laughs> he put our groups together, like the newbies together, and he created a Facebook group. The way he prepared the way for us was incredible. You know, like, it's like, okay, so I'm a teacher like you guys, you know, so I will be here to answer questions if you have any about the school, about the country, about things, you know, so every question that we had, uh, and he created a fun name for our group, like every group that would come there, we, we had a, a name, you know, so it was kind of like fun, uh, the way he welcomed us, the way he took our questions seriously, uh, so whatever we asked or even things that we didn't even imagine about asking, he would provide like a few like, oh, this is how the plugs look like in Myanmar. You know, oh, this is the voltage or this is that or look at the picture of, uh, you know, like the rainy season or look at this, you know. So little things and hints that we could just like, oh, OK. So by the by the time that I got there, I felt like I knew Graham. It's it was Graham, <laughs> you know, like it was it was so nice. And at the airport. So in order for things in Myanmar complicated i don't know if you know greg but like uh, myanmar was a military it was under the military for a, a number of years and then recently they started with elections democracy was starting so it's a brand new country so like everything has to be watched as well right so in terms of visas and stuff um our school provided a business visa for us so we were there under a business visa um, so for me, for some of the, for some citizens, depending on what country you were from, you had to process your visa in Thailand. And then from there, you would get your visa in Thailand. And then once you got it, you could fly to Myanmar because it's neighboring countries. Like it's a, an hour and a half away. Uh, it's a very short flight. Uh, for some people, they would arrive with a tourist visa. Uh, and then once they were there in the country, they could process their business visa. Um, so it was different for different nationalities. So, so for me, I had to go to Thailand, process my visa there. And then there I met another colleague that I, I knew from the Facebook group. So that was an amazing idea that Graham had to put us together so we could 
talk a little bit. We could know who was who, you know, could see pictures, uh, friend, befriend people, you know. Uh, so I met him there at the embassy during the visa thing. So like, oh, Steven, you know, like, yeah. So we're traveling together. So I get to Myanmar, uh, like I'm landing. And then so I look through the window and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> like, I am in Myanmar. What if I don't like it? What if, what if I don't even know? What if, what if, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's real. Like we are landing right now, you know? So I look through the window. There's a lot of green because it was the rainy season. Um, so I'm, I'm going through the escalators and all of a sudden I see this shadow of a person back there like just waving and like oh, that is grab you know so that was so nice you know like having that oh I know him I although I didn't you know like so I'm like okay so there is someone waiting for me there is you know things are gonna be okay it was such a nice feeling getting there so we get there uh, we go through customs, show our passports, show everything, documents, go through everything. And then here there were uh, there was Graham and uh, my principal, my secondary principal waiting for me there at the airport. And then Stephen was there as well with his wife. So we will go all together. But then the best thing was when we got to the airport and we got our suitcases, Graham was there and said, let's take a selfie. I'm like, I knew I was in the right place then because <laughs> I like <laughs> I usually Debbie is the selfie queen. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, let's have a beer first, you know, or something like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's Greg. Greg is the beer king. Sorry. Well, not really here, but yeah. You know what I love about your description, uh, Debbie, is there's nothing like that first ride from mm. the airport to your new accommodation. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, the anxiety, the excitement, just that sort of whole uh, cauldron of emotions is, is a strong moment, I think, at least for me, but I bet for most international teachers. And I just love the way that you, uh, you know, it's almost like you took that ride yesterday from the <laughs> airport to your place, and the, the way you describe it. Uh, it's quite something. It, and it was, it was a nice, very warm welcome. And I, I feel that the welcoming committee or this is a very, very important role in a school, especially international school. Like we had that at coach as well with Elaine. Uh, she would always welcome us as well. As soon as we got there, there was like a, a welcome package with things like these are Turkish things. So see, this is how people use it. Like it just little things, but it makes you feel so welcome. Um, and it's a, it, it's important. Debbie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you went ahead and became that coordinator when Graham left. I was with him, actually. I was with him. We worked together because I'm like, I want to join that. I want to help. I want to help uh, do that as well. Uh, so you so paid it forward by becoming one of the coordinators. Yeah, I loved it. And there were three of us in the committee and it was such an amazing and rewarding experience. Yes. All right, let's take a moment for a little commercial about how to get in touch with us. You can, of course, find all four of us at the itpexpat.com. That's www.itpexpat.com. Or you could also find us at email at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Or if you're into Facebook, we have a new Facebook group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash ITP expat, where you can find all kinds of inside information about ITP expat. You can also find us on Instagram at ITP expats. That's with an S ITP expats is our handle. All right. And thank you, listeners. We have over a hundred countries represented by our listeners. And though we're not monetized, we are here for you. And we would like to thank all of you for listening. So let's get back to the show.
So you were that person going to the airport, helping new teachers come on board. That was one of the things that you did in that position. Yep. Was it a kind of a shot in the arm for you? Because, you know, it, it, sadly, after the years go by, that initial excitement, we kind of forget that. And and just sort of the everyday bits of life kind of get on. Is it a kind of shot in the arm of enthusiasm when you get to work with those new teachers coming in? Let me tell you, I got to do that once because we we did that and then COVID came. That's right. And then the coup d'etat happened. So for us, it was difficult. So it was like an online kind of thing afterwards and we tried to do that, but it's completely different. Unfortunately, I only got to do that once because I was still in the country after COVID. I decided not to go back home. I decided to spend the summer in Myanmar. And Asia was a completely different story, right? When it came to borders and taking things very seriously. In Myanmar, when COVID hit, there were six ventilators in the whole country. Oh, so they knew that if COVID got there, everybody was going to be in serious trouble. So the government was really active. I feel so very thankful for, for the government of Myanmar for keeping me safe. You know, so because I had a job, I was working, I was working less hours. My salary was the same. I did not have to sacrifice anything for the sake of others. While other people were sacrificing, you know, their jobs and, 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 and all of that for me, <laughs> you know, so I felt so thankful. And it was such a difficult feeling as well to think like, wow, I am not losing anything. And yet I feel like. I'm making more money because I don't have any place to spend my money. And yet people are sacrificing everything that they have to, so then the community is safe, you know? So it was difficult. Um, but I decided to stay over in the country during that time. A lot of my colleagues, they had the opportunity to leave and they left, which was hard. It was very hard. So like we were online, but some people were in the country. Some people were not. Uh, if we left, we, we thought initially like I think everybody else, that you would be able to come back. But Myanmar closed the border for quite a while. So like people who were out, then they wanted to come back in and they couldn't just because there were no visas available. There was nothing available. There were no flights available, like because the country was locked. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was a different um, situation as well in life in Myanmar. What can I say? I am very thankful People there are incredible. It's such an incredible people that we have there. People are so humble. People are so thankful. People are so honest. I know things are changing because the situation is getting difficult there financially, economically, right? My students, I think they are the best of the best. Like so respectful. Teachers are so respected in the society. They compare the teachers with Buddha. Like it's... It's a whole different level of respect, you know, saying like in Turkey, there is this kind of status as well. When you say you are a teacher, people look at you differently. But in Myanmar, it was it was a high, high respect level of respect. It's such a poor country. Uh, so you see people suffering, you see the needs and stuff like that. The simplicity, the simplicity of the people, the way they take life, they take the challenges. But it was... So rewarding. And living through the cool, that was very, very difficult. Because we just woke up one day and I looked at my cell phone and I saw like Aung San Suu Kyi, the main leader of the country, she was arrested. And we were like, what is going on? You know, so it, it was just so sudden. So then we had a, a quick meeting, a staff meeting, like, okay, What's going on? Like, there's a staff meeting. But I think everybody was in shock, <laughs> completely in shock. Because so they said, like, we don't know what's going to happen, but maybe Internet's going to be working. It's not going to be working. So, you know, like maybe this, but we're going to carry on the day like as normal. And we we're like, oh, we were already online because of COVID. But it was just so much. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, when am I going to call my family? So if I if we won't have Internet. How can I tell my family about what's going on? Can I have time to go to the grocery and buy provisions? Because I don't know what's going to happen. What am I supposed to expect? Like, what are we don't know? 
right? So it was it was a difficult, tense situation and how the situation evolved as well. Like there was peaceful protests in the beginning and people were so nice, so kind. You know, people were protesting and they were giving water to the guards. For example, they said the guards have they are just they, they're here under orders. It's not their fault. I know that a lot of schools in different hardship countries of political unrest, volatile countries, that the school is really that comfort zone for you. You don't really know who to talk to to get the real news. You don't want to know from your neighbor. Maybe you don't know and people are going everywhere. But your school probably would have a big meeting, like you said, right away. Here's what's going on. Here's our plan. And here's what you do if you need help. I would hope that was the case for you. And in my case, in other countries, it was like that. Like Venezuela, we had we have an evacuation plan. The school has explained all of that to us before it actually happened, and we were prepared. But I never lived through a coup like you did, twice, three times maybe. But do you agree with that statement? I mean, I, not every school is going to like corral around their teachers, but I think a lot of schools do. I think our school was, I mean, everybody was caught by surprise. Uh, because it was not something that we were preparing. I, I think Venezuela, because of the tension, the constant tension, you you are more prepared. But for us, there were elect, like elections happened in the November before. Uh, and then that was happening in February. So it was something that, to be honest, we weren't prepared. I don't think the school was prepared. And we had already suffered through COVID with a financial situation there as well. The school did take care of us throughout all of that. And there were meetings happening constantly, like staff meetings held by the director. So he tried to bring us together. But then it's also interesting because we all process things differently. Absolutely. So for some of us, it's like, let's just carry on. Like we need to just think of normalcy. School has to be something where it's something that is constant and normal. Well, because you're dealing with children, right? So you're you're constantly thinking about what are the kids feeling at this time? They've got COVID, now they've got the coup. So you're mm-hmm. when you're dealing with children, that becomes your priority. Well, some teachers melt down though, right? And, it, and like you said, some yeah. people take it different ways and the meltdown happens and, and you've got to come together. So that's what I was mentioning it. Everyone does feel differently, but you don't really know what to do in any situation because you're sort of new there or you're a visitor in that country, even if you've been living there for a while. But you need to go to somebody for help, and that's sort of like the organization Mm -hmm. that will help you. Wow. (laughs) Were you one of the ones that was very stable and like, here, we got to plow through and worry about the kids and get this done? I... I have to say that that was my 20th year of teaching and that was the most rewarding, but the most difficult year because I was in the country. Yeah. Wow. Most of the teachers were not in the country. So that was also different because we were living through the same thing in a way, but differently. And we all kind of tried to help, but differently. Right. So I felt being in the country with the kids because at some point we wouldn't have internet at night. Right. Like from this time to this time, there was no Internet. Uh, so it's it's just this constant kind of like you feel so tired thinking about worst case scenarios or preparing for something that might happen or it may not happen. But people I think one thing that people don't understand is the tension that goes into your mind. Like when you are oh, they are saying that there may not have Internet for two days. So you prepare for that, but like all the preparation that it takes, okay, so maybe I should buy more credit. Maybe I should uh, make sure that I buy a VPN or maybe I should make, uh, I I should find a way to just make phone calls or, you know, like all those kind of like this, 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 this. Um, And then if it doesn't happen, people say, oh yeah, but it didn't happen. But all the preparation that it took you, it makes you exhausted because you don't know. And that's what it happened to the kids as well. They said, I'm downloading a bunch of movies because internet's going to go down. Right. But at the same time, what about water? What about water and power? Did you have all that? I mean, I am used to those kinds of things. Like when there's political problems, there's infrastructure goes down, not just internet, but I mean like water and food and, and some things like that. What did Gasoline. that and gas? Did did those things happen to you in during that coup that you uh, had? 
Not really. It was more Good. internet that they Good. could control. Like Myanmar, the, the electricity is not great anyways. <laughs> like, so we have seasons where the, the, the electricity goes down a lot uh, due to infrastructure problems. But also what we had to deal with after a while was violence. It happened. Oh, yeah. Like we heard gunshots. Mm-hmm. You know, people were protesting and then protests were not peaceful anymore. And like people were so naive in a way that it hurt us because one of my colleagues, she she received a phone call from uh, one of the workers saying like, is it true that the Americans are coming tomorrow to kind of save us, help us? So that kind of level of, oh my gosh, because they were feeling like we're doing a peaceful protest, like the world is seeing us. And when we think about that, it's like, oh, heartbreaking. Wow. So you see the peaceful protest and then it evolves to something that is not as peaceful anymore. And then it evolved into like social punishment kind of thing. So like people were striking, but then with people striking, they also wanted to receive their monies, uh, but their, their payments, but then there was no work being done. So there was a lot of peer, uh, like society pressure. You shouldn't go to work. But then the whole country stops, which was the point. But then it doesn't work. It was like, so we went out of cash. Uh, so suddenly the school couldn't pay us the way that they were paying us anymore. And all of a sudden I'm stuck there in the country. Um, and I need my money because Myanmar is very money, uh, money society. Like cash. We had bank accounts, but we were paid cash mm-hmm. or deposited abroad. So, so we decided every month how how much money cash I wanted. I wanted dollars, or I want Myanmar chat, you know. And all of a sudden, there was no Myanmar chat because people after the coup, people just went to the bank and they wanted to withdraw their money, but there was no money available for everybody to withdraw, right? Wow. So, so banks collapsed. So there was no money and then there was there were no dollars. So at one point the school was struggling and they said, like, listen, we cannot pay you your cash money this month. And we we're like, what does that mean then? How, how are you going to do this then? Like, when can you pay? Oh, we don't know. So that was... Did a lot of your students leave? A lot of the families that were there at the school, did they leave during these harsh times or did most of them stay? Most of them okay. stayed. Okay. Most of them stayed. So being with the kids for me, it was very rewarding because I'm like, guys, I know it's tough. Like, cause I'm going through that as well. You know? So it's like, and I'm here, I'm with you yep, guys. You're stable for there them. Was pressure as well. Yeah. Although we were all diff- living it differently in some neighborhoods, they, they were hearing gunshots all the time. In my neighborhood, we heard it twice, you know? So like, so we were talking about that as well. So how are you? Are you guys safe? Are you? Did you hear anything? Did you hear protests? Like at one point, people were protesting at 7 p.m. People were protesting with pens and pots. Also, I had military kids in my classroom and also non-military kids in my classroom. You know, so to me, as a teacher, thinking about the future of that country, I felt so proud because I'm like, I have the two of you here in my classroom and you guys are together. Society is falling apart. You guys are together. There is hope for this country. So to me, it was so rewarding, you know, so rewarding as a teacher thinking about, I'm like, guys, you have no idea how proud I am. Like, you know, like you, you guys have no idea. This is so beautiful to see. And I am so hopeful you will do something different you know, because you guys are here right now, you know, and I'm so proud because there is hope, you know. So I felt that way with them. And it was hard for them. It was hard for it was hard for everybody. It was uncertainty. It it's it's difficult. It's very difficult. Has the school managed to stay open the entire time since then? It did. It did. Mm-hmm. But I didn't I, I was planning on staying there over the summer, but I the school was also struggling financially mm-hmm. and they had to let go six people at the end of the school year after the school was. So I felt very, I'm like, I don't feel very safe. Mm-hmm. You know, like when it was only the two, two, two teachers that were going to stay over the summer, it was the librarian and me. Um, but then they fired her. 
<laughs> they oh. they released her from her contract and five other people because of enrollment and all of that and all the situations. So I'm like, am I going to be here alone? I mean, without with a cash problem with everything. Mm-hmm. And so we were buying cash in the black market. So you, we had to pay to have cash. If I understand Debbie correctly, you finished out the school year. And then at the end of that year, you had the option to travel out of uh, the country, but you, your dedication to the school, you were planning on staying that summer, despite the hardships that continued into the summer. It was still uncertain about the COVID visa and stuff. So I thought it's too much to go out because If I were going to go out at that point, COVID was still present, I would go to Brazil. And like to teach from Brazil, people were having a Mm. having a miserable time teaching from the U.S. in Myanmar. Right. So I'm like and I'm not a big fan of the city where my parents are right now in in Brazil. So I'm like, I will hate it. So I'll stay here because here I have my own apartment. I have, you know, it's the same time zone. And uh, I I yeah, uh, and additionally, when you get back to Brazil, your mom's going to convince you to go back to Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> She's like Turkey. <laughs> you just had to prove her wrong about Turkey, didn't you, Debbie? <laughs> they love Turkey. They absolutely love Turkey. That's for sure. They're like, look at look at look at the ugly step redheaded stepchild now. <laughs> So Debbie, I remember you. I like I I followed followed your uh, Facebook feed like um, like nobody's business during that whole time because of course I was concerned for your safety and concerned for you uh, and your school your situation and I remember that struggle and then I remember you reached out to me that April so I, I'm kind of fast forwarding but just that April you were my first client. And I can't tell you how much that meant to me reaching out and saying, Hey, I need help with my CV. Cause I think <laughs> I'm going to be going somewhere else. Yeah, that was, that, that was, that was great. Jacqueline that you were able to help me out with my CV and like oh, hints and tips that you gave me. And like, this is, this is something, this is a heading that you can hear, you know, like, I'm like, Oh, okay. That's nice. You know? So that was super valuable to me because I'm like, I knew I was going to go and then I had put my things already at search. um, I assessed, but that was a difficult year too. Because once I left Myanmar, I'm like, I'm not going to come back. I I know it's going to be my last school year. I've lived through a bit too much and I, I love it here. I love the students, but I'm tired. (laughs) Did you end up leaving that summer then, or did you stay that summer? I continued, like, I left that summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I left to Brazil. I kept my contract, but I said, um, I cannot stay in Myanmar because I don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I left Myanmar, so I went back to Brazil, and I taught a whole, pretty much that whole year uh, from Brazil. Yeah, she was talking about keeping vampire hours. She's like, I don't see the sun because she's working through the night. So what, what were your hours from Brazil working then? 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. Wow. <laughs> it was awful. I yes. hated every second of it. It was difficult. And so when I left Myanmar, I sold pretty much all the things that I wanted. I gave away things. I kept few basic things in my apartment thinking like if I if I happen to come back here to wrap the year up, then at least I have a house to go back to uh, or the basics and I can come back. Uh, but I, I knew I was not going to renew my contract with, with the school. So let me ask JP, were you like, did you follow Debbie's progress over the course of that next year? And were you guys were in contact, kind of maybe talking about her next steps. What do you remember about this period? Well, just remember, yeah, I started in April. So she reached out to me in April for that fall. Like she was looking for a job that fall. And I was at, okay. And I just buckled down and put all my focus on Debbie trying to find, I mean, first of all, a Spanish position in the world There's like maybe one or two positions in every school that offers Spanish. 
But then what are the chances those people are leaving? And what are the chances they're leaving in April or announcing it in April? I mean, it was just a very uphill climb, but I I was very hopeful and I knew Debbie was the candidate to try and find a job for because of her experience, her education, her background, everything was lined up for her. So we just needed to find that opening. And as it turned out, I had nothing to do with it. Debbie found the opening. What, uh, how did you find this? This is the one, the opening that led you to your, your current assignment. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about, yeah. Tell us about that, Debbie. So, like, so yeah, I, I knew that I was leaving that year. So I think I started updating my CVs and stuff like in October, talking to search and stuff. Or uh, So I started, I think, probably October, December, more or less, trying to get my reference, reference letters. That was tough as well. So you have to prepare in advance, right? So you have to, because you need your, your directors to, to write a letter or your principals to write a letter. So you have to depend on a lot of people in order to get the process going. And it was, it was getting... I got a few interviews and stuff, but nothing lined up. So when Jacqueline posted something about, you know, what her new business and like what she was helping people with, I'm like, you know, like that would be a great idea if Jacqueline just takes a look in my CV or, or my, like, I hate doing those kind of like letters of, uh, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm terrible with that. I don't know if I'm writing it properly. I don't know if that is, you know, like, I, I'm not really sure how to do it. So it was great talking to Jacqueline back then. And I'm like, you know, I think that would be a great help. You know, you can take a look because you are my boss, <laughs> right? You, you, you are used to seeing that as well. Like what is appealing? Like what is it that is, because to me, it's like me, right? But what is it that is something that stands out or what doesn't? Or like, what is your eye? So I think that would be, that was a great help for me to put things together. But then Abuja, did Abuja reach out to you or did you find them? It was interesting because this position was open since October. So it was early on in October. I tried to reach out to them. I had uh, one of my friend, one of Maria Lisa's friend, she works here. So they work together in Oman. <laughs> so, and, and then I met this friend in Myanmar. She worked in Myanmar. So we met there. Uh, Is quickly. this Tatiana? That's Tatiana. Yes. So I replaced Tatiana at the American school in Muscat. Oh, yeah. I was like, wait, I think I know who the, you're talking about because <laughs> I went to the American school in Muscat to replace Tatiana and Tatiana moved on to somewhere else, but not Abuja yet. She was Myanmar? somewhere else. Maybe. 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 And then she moved to Abuja and you learned she was there. Like this is the seven connections of Kevin Duncan for sure <laughs> where everybody knows everybody and yet we're talking about the world yeah yeah so she and, and then so I reached out to her I think and I said Tatiana I see that there's a Spanish opening in your school how how is it and I also had one friend that worked with me in Myanmar who was here and I don't know if back then I reached out to her to ask so they mentioned a few things yeah 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 it's you know it's okay it's fine though. but nothing happened back then nothing happened I couldn't even get an interview with them nothing nothing happened uh so I'm like okay fine you know Again, Nigeria wasn't my first on my list. <laughs> so time went by and I was just kind of getting discouraged. I'm like, you know, it's the end of the school year. Uh, I mean, it's April already or, you know, like, okay, so maybe let me change my plans. Maybe instead of me trying to get a job, let me just go back to Myanmar if they open their borders. I'll just go to Myanmar. I'll end the year there at least. I will be able to say my goodbyes in there. I can sleep at night and work during the day. <laughs> you know, like I'll just go there and wrap my year there. So I did that. And right before I left, Tatiana just reached out to me, to Myanmar. And she's like, hey, Debbie, are you so interested in, in working here in Nigeria? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I am. Especially at this point, I'm like, well, why not? And she's like, okay. The position is going to be posted on search soon. So keep an eye on that. Apply for it. I'm like, okay. And then later on, she reached out to me. She said, 
my director is telling you to send your CV straight to him. Okay, I can do that. And then I had an interview before, I think, I think I was in Brazil. No, we were trying to schedule a time to interview. And that happened once I was already in Myanmar. I had an interview with, with the director here. And then I had a second interview with him and I got an offer. <laughs> so Debbie was my first client and then she was the first one to land a job for She was that the first success story call. for JP I was Make Consulting. So, I oh my love gosh. That. I was walking around on cloud nine thinking <laughs> I don't know what kind of help I had in, uh, or what kind of hand I had in you know, getting her into Abuja, but I was so ecstatic. And, and it really did like snowball from there, Debbie. I just wanted to let you know how much I appreciated your confidence in me and then that you, know, you shared your celebration with me with, for whatever little part I had in it, and I was just on cloud nine. Yeah, it was. It was a really good help. It was a really good support to have you like cheering for me as well, asking me about places or thinking, no, this is good for you. Like, you know, because it was such a discouraging time for me, too. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, OK, OK. So it, it worked. Woo. Go ahead, Craig. <laughs> Woo. I'm just throwing. I'm just throwing my. Woo. <laughs> I was going to say, Debbie. Uh, it shows me that what you're one of the teachers has been around in the field quite a long time in different countries, and one of those stories that, for some of us that have been out for a while, it's more about who you know. And it's not as much about the recruiting fairs. Those are just sort of like, well, I could go to one. But it's more like, you know, I'm getting to know more people. Uh, Jacqueline is a great example, too. It's like who you know and who does Jacqueline know. And your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And pretty soon they have people calling you saying, "Ah, don't even go to the fair yet. Just let's interview now and let's start it. Mm, That's true. Uh, I got two questions. Um, My first question is, did you ever make it over to Japan or did the pandemic ruin your opportunity to kind of connect a little bit with your roots? Yeah, unfortunately, I never made it. I never mm-hmm. I, I never had the chance to go. Also, because if I think about it, because I was in Myanmar for five years. So I think two of those years were normal and then mm-hmm. things started going like Two of the years were one of the year was COVID. The other one was a coup and the other one was me back in Brazil and ending the year in Myanmar. So it was pretty much two years. I have to say that a lot of the times that I had the chance to travel, I went back to Turkey mm-hmm. <laughs> to yeah. just That's right. reconnect with, with friends, you know, like that was the place where I felt like, okay, I want to go back there. Okay. My first holiday was October and I'm like, I'm going to go to Turkey. I'm going to go that. to Turkey. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so that's kind of like, I didn't travel much around Southeast Asia either. I did not get the chance to go to Japan. My second question, Debbie, is, you know, you have this temperament, which any one of these kind of challenges in international teaching could just, anyone could just say, I've had enough and I'm done with this. You have not only pushed through every one of your challenges, but here you are today having a great time. You're super positive. You're super fun. Have you always been that way? I mean, when you look back, when you were like young Debbie, you know, little Debbie, (laughs) do you, do (laughs) would you surprise yourself knowing what you know now? Well, let me just say that I'm still young. She's still young Debbie. Debbie, Don't do that. (laughs) Shame on you. (laughs) Debbie, on behalf of the international teacher podcast, we would like to apologize for Kent's comments. Could you you send two apology letters now? One for Greg and one for me. Thank you so much. Please, Please don't sue. Please don't sue. <laughs> you know, to be fair, I did catch myself halfway through you that. You tried to dig out of the hole and it didn't work, Ken. I tried to, but it was already deep. <laughs> now, getting back to your question. Um, uh, I think it's, I always had the, because my family is also, my parents are very international. They met in Japan. My dad is Peruvian. My mom's Brazilian. You know, so like my family is spread around the world. One of my uncle, he is, he is in Costa Rica. You know, the other one is still in Japan. So it's like kind of, so I always, my parents always encouraged me to 
go abroad. There's so much to see, you know, like learn English. You know, like when I was nine, I started going to to a school to learn English because we didn't have English at school. But so we had private classes. So my mom always had this idea of like international. You have to learn English. You have to learn English, you know, because you will go abroad. I mean, that's the language that is spoken, stuff like that. I, I think I've accomplished much more than I thought I would. I always wanted to be abroad and here I am, <laughs> like in a lot of continents even, like, you know, so I am really proud to be able to experience the world that way and to experience the world as a teacher that way. Like, so it is nice. You're saying that I'm positive. I don't, uh, I think I am yes, positive, you are. But, <laughs> uh, but there are times where things are difficult. As I was thinking, for example, well, COVID was Well, it was terrible for everybody all over, no matter what. But I'm thinking as well, after I went back to Brazil for that year, I started doing therapy and that has, and I'm still doing therapy and I'm loving it every, every second, because I feel like it's a, so many losses that you have to process COVID. I, I lost every, every week a family was leaving Myanmar because Myanmar had no structure to what if people got sick? No one knew. So people left like people from my school community people from my church left because it was most expat people so i lost a lot i felt like i lost a lot of people after the coup forget it i lost pretty much everybody left you know so i felt like so many losses to process and that is difficult and in the international world normally you already lose a lot of people every year anyways because people are moving on new people are coming but it is a constant coming, staying a little bit, going, and then soon you leave as well and you start over. And as I was thinking these days about friendships and communities and stuff, I thought in Myanmar, it took me about three years to start feeling like, okay, you know, I have my communities. I know who I am in those communities. I know my role in those communities, you know, so it, it takes time, right? It takes commitment. So now to talk about Nigeria and the fact that when you got to Nigeria and there were struggles and there were issues, where did you go back to? <laughs> so tell us, tell us, because this is very poignant about where you made your new community. You felt at home in Myanmar. So yeah, tell us about that, Debbie. Yeah, it was interesting because I was coming from a very stressful year Uh, stressful years like of COVID, coup d'etat, going back to Brazil, living in Brazil, hating it, and going back to Myanmar. And then I came to Nigeria, which is not an easy country. Like security is of a concern. Uh, like it's a it's a main thing here. Uh, the school keep us safe. Like we have armed guards in the school, like 12 armed guards in the school. Sometimes when we go out for shopping, for grocery shopping, there's a car that goes behind us with armed guards <laughs> like it's just a very interesting different uh situation right so i get here we start the school year and we started the school year online because of security because <laughs> boko haram was in town because i'm in abuja abuja seems to be more like relaxed But in Boko Haram is not based here, but they were here. Some of them were arrested and some of them planned to escape from the prison or something like that. So they were around for a while. So the school was concerned. And because we are very linked with the, the American embassy, so they gave us advice on security issues as well. So we decided to start the school year online for the first couple of weeks. So that was interesting because I'm coming from a tense situation in Myanmar. I'm coming here and we're starting the year online. So I'm like, okay, but it was an easy start. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know? And then, so we go for the, our October break. We come back after a week, we start hearing their extension. Uh, and the director calls us in and says, okay, so we're going to be doing school online for a little bit because, There's a little bit of attention here in the city and stuff. And then we start hearing that the American diplomats are, their families are departing. They, are, they have the option to depart the country. And we're like, 
what is going on again? You know, and then all of a sudden we hear like it's an order departure. It's no longer, you know, an option, but the families have to leave Abuja. The director calls us in, in a meeting, like says, okay, guys, here's what's happening. You know, there are some security issues. And because it's the American embassy, so sometimes we don't know exactly what's going on. So we have to rely on their information or, you know. They have the the expertise, right? mm -hmm. Yeah. So the director said the Americans, as you might have heard, the American diplomats are being, you know, ordered a departure. It's uh, in, therefore, I am requesting that you guys also leave the country because we want to keep you guys safe. We, you know, there is a concern uh, and we want to make sure that everybody's safe. So you have, you know, tomorrow and the day after we won't have classes. Uh, And so, yeah, everybody was shocked i was like what and then they said okay <laughs> this so again we, yeah, i know it's like so when do we how long do we have when do we have to go like he said three or four days and we're like oh in three or four days i mean for me i was yeah, you, i had just arrived. you're like i got this I, I got this i've been through this kind of <laughs> stuff before i'm fine hey anybody need I some help t-shirt i need some st- i have some stability <laughs> for you you, I've been through coups before. You need some help? I can arrange it. <laughs> I'm sorry to make light of it. We have to be a little fun, but boy, what a situation. Oh, I mean, yeah. you're just surprised. Like three or four days, I have to be what? Out? What do I do next? Exactly. And people are like, but for how long? Because depending on how long, then you can make plans to go somewhere. You know, like if it's a few weeks, then you can just go back to your country, see people and then come back. But then if it's like, two months <laughs> or and then elections were coming in april as well and we're like or maybe we're not going to come back until april because there's going to be tension because of elections or you know, so there were lots of things that were we were wondering and he said minimum a month we're not going to take you guys out of the country just for you know two weeks and call you guys back well that was very fair to think that you know because you could be going to say like a, a holiday destination Mm-hmm. You know, you, you hopefully people didn't think of this or, or didn't plan this, but you could end up going in a holiday situation saying, oh, you know what, it's going to be a week or two weeks. I'll go to the Maldives. And then all of a sudden you're there for six months and your bank account's empty because because <laughs> you, you can't afford to stay. So I'm really happy to hear that the director had some foresight to say it's going to be a minimum of a month so that people would plan accordingly. And also they gave us like a stipend as well to help us out because that was unexpected and it's a lot of, incurs a lot of expenses as well. So yes, because of that, I went, I ended up going back to Myanmar. Um, I was in a relationship back then. So I'm like, perfect opportunity. (laughs) I thought you were going to say Turkey. I really thought you were going to say Turkey. I would, I would go to Turkey if I wasn't in that relationship. So I'm, I'm, I would have gone to Turkey, but I went to Myanmar. When I got there, people were just like, okay, okay, no, no, no. Let's, let's see if we understood it right. You left Myanmar because of the situation. You went to Nigeria <laughs> and now you're taking refuge in Myanmar. And now you're back. And they're like, <laughs> they were like, oh, we're so sorry This is for brilliant, you. <laughs> really. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is, you yeah, need to write a book. I, uh... I'm telling you. This is gold right here. This is this is the gold level of guest star on I, the ITP absolutely. because the stories. I mean, Debbie, it is it has been an incredible journey, and and then full circle, folks. I mean, not to again fast forward, but full circle. This year, I had a client who was considering Abuja, and I said, "Well, you know what." Let me reach out to my good friend, Debbie, and see if she'll uh, handle some of your questions. And so I I, I asked Debbie if I could uh, pass on her contact info, and then they started chatting. And now I'm so excited to see uh, Jessica and Debbie in their each other's Instagrams because Jessica went. She ended up getting to Abuja. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Connections. 
And here we are a year later from the events of, of last year. And how, how has the situation been? It's been almost weird because it's been normal. I, I finally get to have a normal year. <laughs> You're not sure what to do. Things are normal and quiet and calm. <laughs> and within the regular daylight hours. <laughs> it's just like, what? what? What is this? But one thing that I've been asking people, like, so what are you planning for evacuation this year? <laughs> so, <it's, laughs> so people are like, no, no, please don't. You started the year, you weren't online, you weren't evacuated. I mean, here we are in October and knock on wood. Knock on wood. <laughs> My life feels so boring right now. I don't, I mean, <laughs> listening to your stories, I feel like my stories are like boring, man. What about you, Kent? Boredom. Yes, I feel like your stories are boring. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I walked right into that one. Yes, you did. Yes. <laughs> oh. I like your stories, Greg. Uh, let's see. I, I, I did want to say, um, so, oh, this is Wait, why let we, me put record on and uh, we'll start the show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what? This was this was the practice. We, let's go ahead and so do Debbie, the show So, Debbie, I'm going to hit record and, and then we'll go back through the story. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> I love that. So, uh, oh yeah, tell our listeners, uh, uh, Debbie, just a few words about Abuja. Is Abuja the the capital of Nigeria? Yes, Abuja is the capital of Nigeria, um, but Lagos is the main city where things happen. Abuja, they say that it's a lot more laid back, also less dangerous. <laughs> they say so, like the crazy things, you know, it's in Lagos. So Lagos is the city where you have everything. Everything good and everything bad. Yeah. Uh, all the traffic in Isn't the world. Isn't it also huge? Like 15 million people or something in Lagos? Yeah, I heard there's quite a few. I don't know if it's yeah. 30 million that I is. heard today, but I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not so what's sure. the population of Abuja then? I think it's about 8 million. Yeah. And your students, is the oil industry active in Abuja? Here in, in Abuja, we are more like um, the political capital. Yes, the diplomatic and political capital. So your students are the sons and daughters of diplomats and foreign workers in the capital. Okay. Politicians. So we have a lot of those like, oh, yeah, my dad is in politics. In poli One of our students, his dad ran for presidency this the past year, this year. So that was interesting. In Nigeria? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Really nice. So I didn't know until he was like, "Can I? Can I just see the results?" I'm like, "I don't. Well, do you have class right now?" Like, My dad is good. I'm like, "Oh, okay." Oh. And it's like, "Oh, oh, okay." <laughs> then I understood, and I thought, "Oh, interesting." All right, yeah. Google. Thank you. Uh, Abuja is four million. So yeah, I what I enjoyed about hearing you were applying and then and then getting into Abuja, the international school there, was that you were going to have that experience that I think is one of those true but very rare international teaching experiences where your class is like a model UN, mm -hmm. where you have nationalities from all over the world, and there you are, you're teaching in the common language, usually in English, of course, and you. In your case, you'd be uh, teaching them in Spanish, but they're they're a mix of colors and uh, races and and religions, and they're all coming together in that one school. It is this is the most international school that I have taught because in Turkey, most of the most I know I think one hundred percent of my students were Turks. In Myanmar, we had a few international students, but most of my students were Myanmar students. Here, it is like, just like you mentioned, Jacqueline, it's students from all over the world. Uh, so Israel, Palestine, I have one from Poland, I have German students, I have Korean students. It's just like so much. Do you have any Brazilian students? There is a half Brazilian student, but he's not my student. He's taking French. Okay. Left or right half? <laughs> Which half? Left, right? <laughs> Which half? <laughs> Top half, bottom half. Yeah. Is your staff also that kind well, of international? Most of our teachers are Americans. Okay. We have a few Australians. We have the a Romanian teacher who is a, Tatiana, who teaches French and Spanish. Hi, Tatiana. Do you speak Canadian, Debbie? I'm still learning. I don't. 
Uh, but I understand it. I understand it. <laughs> I'm still learning. I've been learning for years. We don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> what is uh, what's on your uh, bucket list, uh, Debbie? What's what do you kind of things do you think about for your future? Oh, good question. I for now, I think my uh, short term future because this is my my fall break. And I'm so happy just to be here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing a course right now, like um, that the school requires me to have an American uh, an American teacher's license. So I'm doing uni courses to get the credits and also then to apply for uh, the American teacher's license. So it's funny uh, um, because in all my other schools, they never asked for that. So I was kind of like angry in the beginning, but now I'm like, you know what? It's PD money. They're paying for it. I'm loving it. The, you know, like talking to other people and doing homework together and complaining about things, you know? So I'm, I'm going to be pursuing that for the coming future, for the near future. Family is always there. I would love to bring my parents here to just see mm. Abuja. Uh, you nice. know, they like to, before before COVID, they would go to wherever I was and they would stay with me for like a month. So, you know, just to experience. My, my parents, they don't care about going Your out. Your parents much, sound so fun. They I are. love that. Yeah. Wow. yeah. You know, I, I will say this. I will say that the two of you, JP Mint and Debbie, I think you represent the best part of international teaching. You guys met on the job teaching internationally. You've supported each other through the years. And here we are. I don't know how many years later, but it's still talking like you guys almost talk every day. And it's just it's been lovely. Excuse me, Kent. And this is what I think uh, I love. What about me, <laughs> Kent? You, I mean, it's like, oh, wait. I'll just sit back and listen to you compliment the other the other two. Okay, that's fine. I understand. They're much I'm better not. looking than I am. I understand that. <laughs> I, uh, you, you know what? Greg and I ate pizza together every day over the summer. He lives next door. His classroom is 100 yards away from mine. I can hear him when he sneezes. <laughs> Kent, have you ever met such a positive person? I mean, Debbie is the uh, most no, positive. Jacqueline, think- I'm so glad that you know her. Yeah, Jacqueline, thank you for bringing uh, oh, all of your Debbie, guests on, but amazing. Debbie's been great. Positive. And I'm going to tell the ITP crowd that uh, the new lineup will be Jacqueline, Kent, the cat guy, and Debbie will be uh, hosting the ITP from now on. Am I getting Greg, kicked we out? You your, <laughs> we we want to thank you for your service. You've done a great job. <laughs> so thank they you. They like you more, Debbie. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> thank you for sorting out my future, too, Kent. Now I know what's happening. It's great well, for record will end. In two seconds, two, one. <laughs> I got control of the recording here. <laughs> can I ask you two questions, or can we ask you two questions, Debbie, that are really sure. throughout ITP? On the International Teacher Podcast, one of my favorite is to say, of all the places that you go, can you name two or three things that, three things, excuse me. Um, that's my director again. De- she, she's, she's Jacqueline's like, Greg, it's three. It's three, always three. Um, <laughs> she's showing yeah. you three fingers now, but she's about to show <laughs> A you different one. one yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Debbie, as you go from country to country, which you do pretty easily, are there three things that you take with you to make you more, feel more comfortable? Yes. I think the apartment, the place where I live is very important for me. If that's not set, for me, my whole life is unsettled. That's how I feel, and especially after COVID. With my apartment's okay, whatever happens outside, it's okay because this is my home, this is my base, this is where I feel comfortable. And yes, uh, just like Jacqueline, like after living in Turkey, I also have my carpet here. This is my bunny. Uh, oh my, my gosh, carpet. it is a bunny. You have a rabbit? She has rabbit. a bunny. It's a real rabbit. So it's not a stuffed an animal in the middle. That's right. That's, a, that's a rabbit in the middle of your. That's a rabbit in the middle of your carpet. Yeah, and she is yeah. destroying my carpets. Her name is Blossom, but I call her Bunny Zinha, like which is bunny in English, and Zinha, which makes like little bunny in Portuguese. So it's the combination of the two. I think you should <laughs> call her Coup, Coup d'etat. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Am I laughing? Right. Am I making light of that again? I can't help it. You're just amazing to have lived through so many problems. Okay. Okay. And what's your third one? 
Do you have a third one? I have little things that I like to collect. So that's my shelf right there. So little things from all different countries. And even one of them, when I left the U.S., like a while ago, one of my friends, she gave me something from Colombia because she was Colombian. She's like, I want you to take this with you, which has lots of little things typical from Colombia. Something light. And she yeah. wrote a little note for me uh, in, in, on the bottom of the, the thing. I always take pictures of it and show it to her like, now this is in Myanmar. Now this is now this is in Nigeria. Now this is in Turkey. You know, so that in my magnets, my You're a magnet mag- person. the magnets that I collect. When I left the United States, I took my dad's garage door opener by accident. My dad, after I moved to Honduras, my dad's like, Greg, do you have my garage door opener? And I'm like, no, dad, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, right? From then on, everywhere I went, every country I went to, I always had a picture of me with the garage door opener somewhere in the picture. I mean, all over the world. And my mom said, Greg, your father never sees it. I always have to point it. He, he never notices it, Greg. And I'm like, every year, I'm like, no, I don't know where it is. I'd go home for the summer. I'd be like, do you have a garage door opener? He'd be like, no, you can't have one. You still have mine. I'm like, no, I don't. So finally, I think it was about, uh, about six years ago, Father's Day, I gave him a book that had all of the pictures oh. and the countries that that had been to, even underwater. But that was, a, I forgot, that was one thing I've always taken with me. I just found it in a box, actually. So that's what made me think of that. Other people have flat Stanley. Oh, yes. You have or the a gnomes. garage door I have a garage opener. door opener from Dad. <laughs> yes, I do. He knows about it now, so it's not as much fun. But I think I'm going to publish a nice book just for him about that. Thank you for playing the game, Debbie. And that's one of the ITP questions. Oh, uh, man. Miss uh, Debbie, do you have a run-in with the authorities, the police, uh, customs agents, any stories from around the world where you just ran into authority? Yeah, unfortunately, here in Nigeria, (laughs) those kind of custom stories are a regular thing. It was interesting because coming into the country for the first time, being a Brazilian, so we are suspicious, we are scared of, you know, like, because we never know, I mean, you know, we know our people. I got here and then the school arranged a guy to come and pick pick up my luggage for me and help me out. Outside, I'm like, that's awesome, right? So he came and he helped me with my suitcases. And when we're going out, and here in Nigeria, you have to take all your suitcases and run it through the x-ray machine. So it runs through the x-ray. And then there are a bunch of people standing by the door when you're about to leave. And they say, what do you have in your suitcase? My stuff, like clothes. And do you have any food in there? Do you have any food in there? I'm like, well, I brought some beans and coffee. What else? What else? I'm like, being a Brazilian, beans and coffee should be enough. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like, you know, like, well, that's it. So they were not happy, but they were like, okay, okay, just give us some money here. Wow. <laughs> and like, right off the bat. Out right off the bat. They just, didn't even bother to to hint at it or anything. They just said, give us the money. Give us some money. And, and they, they have my passport. They are all uniformed, man. You know, like a bunch of them. And I looked at the guy carrying my suitcase. He says nothing. So I'm like, okay, so that has to be normal. I'm like, I'll have to give them some money. Because with a Brazilian mind, I think they are authority. They can do whatever they, I mean, I no don't choice, know, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I only had like hundreds of like a hundred dollar bill and I gave them a hundred and they were like, oh, God bless you. God bless you. And I'm like, yeah, he better bless me and not you. You just mugged me. It was so annoying. I'm like, <laughs> but then I started asking people because I was so annoyed. And then whenever we go through customs, they always say like, oh, give us some lunch money or, oh, give us this. Oh, you're, oh, my Brazilian sister, you know, give me. So I asked, I started asking people, what do you guys say? One of my friends, she was like, oh, sometimes I say, God bless you. And I'm like, and that works? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> Let's try it. Debbie, can I have some money? <laughs> Oh, that, you you so, learned. So did you only have to pay them once then and then not since then? 
I did not pay afterwards. There was one time that they say like, give me, oh, my Brazilian sister, give me lunch money. And I said, no. And he said, what? I said, no. And he gave my passport back and I, <laughs> they take the no. So it takes time for you to understand it, but they do take the no. Yes. So it's like, okay. <laughs> I would have said, you know, I gave your brother a hundred dollars <laughs> three months ago. Just go just, to him. Just go He's to him one. and get the money from that guy. <laughs> yeah. Wait till Ken <laughs> asks me for money tomorrow, like at school or something. He's going to ask me for some money. I'm going to be like, God bless you, Kent. I can't wait. That's perfect. I love it. Oh, man. You know, it would have been nice if the guy who had your bag gave you a little tip off when you walked. When it might have saved you a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, just a hundred bucks. Yeah, like well, just arriving into the country. Right? Yeah, but he probably got 50. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good point, Greg. Good point. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. Oh, how much fun has this been? I've had a fantastic time. I just want to say how much I've loved hearing all your stories, Debbie. This has been a blast from the past. But also, now, Greg, Kent, we've got to figure out where Debbie can go next, that there's going to be a coup. So uh, what's what's on the horizon? It doesn't matter wherever Debbie. she goes. There's going, let's just be honest. They follow her now. I okay, really please don't come to Mexico. We're here, so I'm like, we made it through. No coup. But there was a coup in Niger, right? She's still going to be positive anyway. She's going to have a positive attitude no matter where she goes. Debbie, do you have any last Last second words uh, for anybody in, say, in Brazil, thinking about doing what you did. I think it is. it would be important to just do it. <laughs> you know, like, look for opportunities. It's like some people, some people feel like, oh, you're so brave. And I'm like, I don't feel I'm brave. I mean, how can I let this opportunity go? <laughs> you know, so I feel like, uh, I feel like that it's opportunities that are there. So just take them, you know, this international life, it's hard because you leave your heart everywhere that you go and it, you're never the same anymore. Whether it's the food that you eat or the things that you would start enjoying or the culture that you know how to navigate, you learn so much, but you also grow so much, right? So I think it's totally worth it. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I'm speechless. Are you speechless? Hey, are we on? We're, We're still, still on. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to follow that. Anybody want to follow that? <laughs> no, let's just. I know. Just the, the. This has been Jacqueline from International Teacher Podcast, and I want to thank. You're gonna edit. You're <laughs> gonna edit this. <laughs> I don't know if I want to edit this. It's too much fun. <laughs> oh.